um, this morning. It was just great fellowshipping with you all. I'm just really thrilled to be here and see what God's going to do this week. This, this evening, I had been really praying about what God wanted me to preach about this evening, and God had put on my heart to give my testimony, um, the story of my life, and what God has done in it. And I, I, I want to tell you this story because and I, I tell you the, the importance of a testimony. It's, it's so powerful. So powerful. And I think back when I was working at the uh, BCM and at, w, at Western Kentucky uh, University, the uh, Baptist Campus uh, Ministries. And, and as I was serving there, they asked me to give my testimony. And, and I did. And I shared so many things about my life, things that I've done wrong. And I just remember the next day this, this young man came up to me, this man from Malaysia. And he looked at me in the eye and he said, Jeff, I just couldn't, I can't figure it out. I don't know why in the world you would share those things that you shared with us. All the nasty things you've done in your life. I just don't understand why you would share that. And then I got to thinking, the only reason that I, the only thing I could think of, the reason why you would share that is because you really believe in this Jesus. And that he really changed your life. And my, he's, he's a good friend of mine named Ong. And, and I sat down with Ong, and we walked through the scriptures, and I shared the gospel with him. And I asked him, I said, what's keeping you from giving your life to Christ? And, and he said, Jeff, he, he, you need to think about this. He said, he looked me in the eye, and he said, Jeff, God knows all things. And he knows I'm being real if I give my life to him. And so this is a serious decision, and I need to go think about it. And... So on goes back, and the next day he comes to me. He said, Jeff, I thought about it. And I got down on my knees, and I gave my life to Christ last night. And so I, I'm, I'm going to share with you some, some nasty things in my life, in my past, things that I've done. But I also want to show you how God can take the broken pieces of your past and bring them together and make something magnificent out of it for his glory and for his name. And so... Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want to lift this up to God. Heavenly Father, I think of your word and the promise in it. For the Lord has made everything for his own purpose, even the wicked for a day of disaster. And God, when I think of that verse, I, oh God, I'm so thankful for it. That you can take the most broken lives, you can take the biggest messes, and you can turn them around and use them for your glory. And you can put a broken person back together. And Father, I think of your words as well. To walk in the light as you were in the light. And so, Father, shine on me. Lord, as, as the scripture says, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. And so, Father, I, I just open myself tonight. I'm just going to expose myself. If I'm going to be a fool, I'm going to be a fool for you. And I'll stand in front of anybody and tell them how much of a fool I've been. But, Father... There's nothing compared to the cross. Father, so I, if anything is highlighted tonight out of this entire story, let it be the cross be lifted high. And let the banner of the cross fly high, Lord. And for all to see, may, it be, may you, Lord Jesus, be glorified. And I pray, Father, that they will see the hand of God in my life all the way up to this point. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember when I was eight years old, I remember seeing my mom packing these towels up into a bag. And I said, Mom, are we going swimming? And she said, no. She said, your dad and your brother are getting baptized. And I said, what is that? And my mom began sharing with me about what Jesus has done for me. 
And at the, age of, at the age of eight, I made a decision to receive this good news that my mom was sharing with me about Jesus. But I'll be honest with you. I don't think that decision was real. And when I was in junior and high school, and for the longest time, I, I, I thought that was the time that I got saved. But when I look back on my life now, the greatest change that I saw was when I made a decision when I was at a youth camp. At a, actually, it was a youth retreat called Chrysalis right here in E-Town. And it was for a, a weekend, weekend trip. And I remember that they had given us, we just got to listen to this powerful message. And they handed us this big bag of letters. And, and inside the bag was letters from all our family members and friends. And they said, go, go spend some time with the Lord and pray. And so I took that bag of letters, and I went out, and I sat by this tree, and I just remember reading through these letters of just encouragement from friends and family members. And then I got to the letter of my mom. And my mom said this. She said, Jeff, it is my greatest desire in life to see you live for the Lord and that God use your life. And that moment, I just I broke down and I began looking back on my life. And I began, and I was examining to see, have I been living for Jesus? And I haven't. I wasn't living for Jesus. There was nothing in my life that would show anyone that I was a believer in Christ. And so in that moment, I, I, just, I just broke down and I, and I realized God, I haven't been living for you. And I prayed this, this, this simple prayer. I said, Jesus, I give you my life. Use it however you want. I serve you. And it was in that moment that a peace came over me. Something that I have never experienced in that moment, I believed that I had a, an encounter with the living Savior. And the days to follow, I knew that there was this great change about me. I had this, this great peace in my heart. I had joy in my heart. And I remember that there was a revival going on in town as well, and I, I went to it. Uh, if I can remember back, I think it was uh, South Fork Baptist Church down in Hodgenville. And I remember that there was a lot of people from my school there at this revival, my high school. And the pastor at the end of the service said, would anyone like to give us an encouragement from the Lord or something that God's been doing in your life? And it's like I had this flame inside of me and I had this desire. I needed to go share with everyone about what had happened to me. And I got up there I went to the pastor and I said, I, I want to share something with people from my school that go here. And I said, last Friday I went to this youth retreat and I surrendered my life to the Lord and the guy that you knew is not the same. I'm changed. And I remember the days to follow that I had a hunger for God's word. I couldn't put it down. In between my classes, I was reading and reading and reading. And, and this joy and this love for Jesus was just growing radically. In fact, I couldn't help but talk about Jesus. I began telling classmates and friends about Jesus. I remember standing in my lunchroom and looking at all the people standing in the lunch line, and I thought to myself, if they don't know you, they're going to hell. And my heart was burdened for that. I was broken for that. Like, I wanted people to know. And I made sure I wanted people to, to, to see. Like, I would read my Bible, and people would ask me, Jeff, why do, you, why do you take your Bible everywhere you go? Why do you walk around with it everywhere you go? And I would just I'd tell them, I, I, I love Jesus. And this is, this is God's word. This is his sword. This is like... This is like going into battle without your weapon. And I remember God just began to do these, these radical things in my life. And I see so many familiar faces in the crowd, so you might recognize some of these names. 
At the time at my church, I was going to Valley Creek Baptist Church, and the youth minister at the time was Jason Hodge, great guy. And Jason, he asked me this. He said, Jeff, he said, we have this youth lock-in coming up. And I believe God's put you on my heart to speak at it. And I said, I don't think that's something I can do. I said, I'm, I'm terrified. of Every time I've ever got, to, got up in front of a crowd to public speak, I, I, get, I lock up. And, and Jason kept telling, encouraging me. He's like, no, God's put you on my heart. So he took me back to this room, and I brought my Bible, and I sat down. And he said, try to find read through the word of God and see what God puts on your heart and I sat back there for an hour and no, no message came to mind I was reading through God's word and he come back and he said so you have anything and I said no and he said well let's go to a fresh setting I'm going to pray for you because I'm sure of this God has put you on my heart and so we go to, a, we go to another room and I begin reading through the word of God again and he prays for me and leaves and finally, I just broke down and I said, God, if you're calling me to preach, if you want me to speak at this youth lock-in, I'll do it, but you've got to give me the words. And I remember it was there, in that moment, the death, burial, and resurrection came to mind. And I began looking at all the scriptures of the death, burial, and resurrection. And all of a sudden, this sermon in front of me began to form. It's like a, like a light bulb went off. And I remember... A good friend of mine uh, named Miss Jeannie and Tracy Bolin were there at the church, and I ran out there into the sanctuary, and I was so excited. I was like, God has given me a message, and I need to share it. And I remember going to this lock-in, and when I got up there to speak for the Lord, it's like something clicked in me. Like I felt filled with the Holy Spirit and, and the words of God just would come out of me. And from that day on, God began to open up doors one after the next. I remember uh, Jason Stewart and Jason Hodge had put on a local trailer park uh, kind of community service deal that we were doing. They had a tent. And I remember that I got asked to speak at it too. And it, it was like a, a, a small community revival. And I began <laughs> preaching the gospel I remember Brother Steve was my pastor at the time. I remember preaching on a Wednesday night. I remember my, FC, my FCA, uh, my football coach, asked me to speak at the FCA at school. And doors after doors just began to open. And when I would go, I would preach this message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God was doing tremendous things in my life. I share that with you, though. Because I want you to see this, this, this change that God has made in my life. But I want you to know this, that the darker days ahead were, were in front of me. I had some dark days ahead of me. And after I graduated from high school, and this is after I've, I've been preaching the gospel, God's been doing radical things, my relationship with the Lord was going so strong. And I think of the scriptures when it says this, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptation in your life is no different than what others have experienced. And I tell you right now, when I got out of high school, that's when the world came after me. And I remember that I was in Walmart one day, and there was this guy that I knew who was really, he was Mr. Popular at my school, high school. And this is after I graduated. And I ran into him, and we began having conversation. And he asked me, he's like, hey, why don't you come over and hang out? And he said, I, I got a few people coming over, and he named off a few people, and some of the people he named off were some of the prettiest girls in my school. And listen to me. Every one of us have desires in our heart. We all do. And one of my, my desires was to have a wife. And I always see these, these people at my school that were Mr. Popular who had the really pretty girl on their arm who had all the attention and all these things. And this guy was one of them, and here he is, he's inviting me over. And not, not to mention he's inviting me over, but he's inviting me over to hang out with some of the prettiest girls in the school. And so I go. I thought maybe this would be a chance to get me a girlfriend. He's like, well, hey, just leave your car here, I'll bring you back over later. So I go, and I, 
I end up at his house, and we're hanging out. And next thing I know, these girls and people are coming over, and they start bringing in this little brown bag. It's got alcohol in it. And at first, I'm like, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. But the more attention that I got from these girls, and the more they flirted with me and gave me the things that I wanted, they began to entice me. The scripture says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. And that night, I gave in to alcohol, and I fell flat on my face and gave in to things that I shouldn't have. And after that, was some of the darkest moments that I felt like such a hypocrite. Because here I was, I was preaching the gospel. Here I was, God was using me. God was doing these great things in me. And then all of a sudden I commit this, in my eyes, was this great sin. This huge sin in my life. I'm like, oh no, what have I done? And then I find myself getting involved with this religiosity, this, this legalism. And like I was telling you this morning, I began to look inside and I began to see all these ugly things. And when I would read the word of God now, I would see, don't do this. Don't commit adultery. Don't commit sexual immorality. Don't get drunk. And I would see these things, I would look inside and I would see that these ugly things were inside of me. And Jesus even said it himself. He goes, it is what comes from inside of you that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within us. And I began to look inside and, and see these, these ugly things. And so I would try to uphold, don't do this, don't do that. And I would just keep seeing, and I keep falling short, and falling flat on my face. And finally, I got so burned out, so tired of it. And I said, Jesus, I can't live the Christian life. And I ran. And I know Jesus. I know him. And, and there wasn't a day that went by in my heart that I, 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 there, I wanted to go back to Jesus, but I didn't want to go back to that lifestyle that I was living, this, this being burned out, fighting against my flesh constantly. And so I ran from God, and I went off to Western Kentucky University, and I began to pursue the things of the flesh. I got down there, and the, the guys living next to me in my dorm, they were smoking pot, getting drunk. I began to go to all these big parties. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm, I find myself, I'm, this is a whole other story, and I don't want to get off trail, but... During high school, I got asked to be a cheerleader, and when I got down to Western Kentucky, I thought I'd never do it again, but when I got down to Western Kentucky University, next thing I know, I'm standing in the elevator at this, this dorm that I'm in, and there's a cheerleader in there. She goes, you used to cheer for LaRue County. It's a long story. I'll get into that later. But she, she's like, so, hey, why don't you come try out for the cheer team? She's like, there's a big scholarship involved. And so I, I, I went, and next thing I know, I'm, I'm on the cheer team, and I'm around all these pretty girls. Next thing you know, we're having these big parties, drinking every night, sleeping around, doing all these things. And I remember that I began to really get into lifting the weights. I wanted that attention from the girls, and I wanted that respect from the guys. And so I began lifting the weights to get big and get, get buff. And I just remember our, the parties began to grow and grow and grow. And remember, if I ever had a moment alone, I would think about the Lord. I would think about where, how far I have fallen. And I grieved over it. There's times where I grieved over it. And I wanted to be out partying. I wanted to be out drinking. I wanted to be out doing those things so I could numb what I felt. And then the alcohol got so much that I began to black out where I would go out and I would drink and I would not remember one thing I did the night before. And people would come up to me telling me all these things began to be very scary. And then my grades in school began to plummet. 
And it got so bad, I, I, knew, I knew that if I did not leave Western Kentucky University, I was going to be a full-blown alcoholic because the blackouts were getting very bad. And so I, I bailed out of school. Last, last, my last day at Western Kentucky University was, had straight F's on my report card, straight F's. And I came home, I drifted around for years. I worked at UPS, and, and let me tell you something. When you, when you try to run from, your, from your, your party lifestyle and all this, it follows you. I went, I went back home to live with mom and dad, worked at UPS, and then I went over and lived with a friend, and the parties just kept coming. And eventually, I ended up saying, I have nowhere to go. And I ended up joining the United States Army back in 2005. I said I needed to make something of my life. I needed some kind of path to be on. Everything else was coming to a dead end. And so I joined the United States Army. And believe it or not, when I went into the Army, I had this desire that I wanted to get my life right with the Lord. And I thought, maybe if I run through all my party friends and I run from these things, then maybe, maybe I can get back into God's Word. Maybe I can start living for Him. And as I was in the United States Army, I began reading my Bible, and I saw moments of fruit, too, moments of things where I was praying to the Lord again. But right after I graduated from boot camp, right after um, the uh, advanced infantry training and airborne school, we end up going back out. And here's the thing, is that when you're in the military, you're around all your friends, you're around all the people that are in your platoon and your squad, and they're all going to hit the bars, and you're not going to sit at the, the, uh, the dorm or your, your barracks and twiddle your thumbs. And so next thing you know, they're all inviting me out to go out with them. I go right back out, right back out into the party and into the drinking, into the sleeping around. And I remember that I got stationed out at Fort Irwin, California, 11th ACR. My mom was praying so hard that I would not go to combat, and she got her prayer I got sent out to the NTC National Training Center. And the National Training Center is where we train soldiers to go to the, we train all the, the units to go to combat, to go over to Afghanistan or Iraq. And Fort Irwin was 31 miles out in the middle of nowhere. And on this, this one lane road on the, out, on the way out there, there's 70, I think 73 crosses of people dying on this road from either drinking and driving, falling asleep at the wheel or something. A lot of people died on that road. We go all the way out there, and where Fort Irwin is stationed at is right between Las Vegas and L.A. And you take I-15 all the way up to Las Vegas, or you take I-15 all the way back down to L.A. And I remember when I got there, I'm, I'm meeting new friends, and sure enough, we're back into the party scene. Now we're going up to Vegas every weekend. We'd spend about two weeks in the field. We'd come back, we'd have all this money saved up, and then we'd go out to Vegas and we'd party it up, going to the strip clubs and going to get drunk and gambling and doing all these things. We'd go down to Tijuana and L.A., go to these, these places that were wicked things were happening. And I'll never forget, we had just got done training with a unit, and we come back in from the field, and their commander told us, he said, do not go back out, do not go out drinking, party, and thing like that, and the next day we have to go, and we have to work with the Navy SEALs, and the moment we, they let us off that day, I remember all my, a bunch of buddies of mine, hey, let's go, let's go, let's go, we only got one night, let's go out, let's hang out, let's get, you know, we've been out in the field for weeks on end, so we drove down to Victorville, California, and we're at this bar, and on our way back, the driver of ours had been drinking. I was in the back seat. I remember we hit Fort Irwin Road, the road that I said 73 crosses were on. And I remember I was in the back seat, and I, I wake up, and I hear the car going over those things on the side of the road that wake you up. And I look up, and I see the driver yank the steering wheel. Next thing I know, we're doing 360s, and then it goes into barrel rolls. And it comes to a stop, and I hunker down in the, in the midst of all of this. And then I look up, the guy that was sitting in front of me is no longer there. I get out of the car and I look back at the car and the whole ceiling is crushed in except where I was sitting. I, look, I check myself over to make sure there was nothing wrong with me. I was, I was good. I walked around to the driver's side and I saw the driver had smashed his head on the steering wheel. There was blood all over the place. 
Then I walked out to the field and to find my friend, I heard him moaning in the field. And next thing I know, the ambulance is coming out there to pick us up to take us back to base. And I come to find out that the, the driver had got ejected out of the, the driver's side uh, window. Or not driver's side, but the passenger side window. He got ejected out of it, wasn't wearing a seat belt. Find out that he has a punctured lung, internal bleeding, broken ribs, and a concussion. And I knew that I was going to have to face my chain of command. And I did. I had to stand before all of them and tell them the truth. And I think back to that car wreck, and I'm like, how in the world am I alive? Why am I, why is there not even a scratch on me? And then, when I faced my chain of command, and eventually the other two soldiers did too, that were with me, we all got punished. They lost their rank, and I didn't. And the reason why I didn't is because I had my sergeants stand up for me to the chain of command. And I'm like, how in the world did I not lose my rank? I should be demoted down to a PV2. I was a private first class. And then, it wasn't long after that, we have a new commander that takes over our troop. And next thing I know, I'm getting promoted. I'm getting promoted to commander's driver, which is a huge responsibility. And now I'm taking care of the commander's vehicle. I have a small squad below me that I have to take care of and I'm in charge of. I have to take care of the XO's vehicle. And I have to take care of the first sergeant's vehicle. And this is a huge responsibility. This is a huge privilege. And here I am. I, I, had, I had done this great, terrible thing. And next thing I know, months later, I'm getting promoted. And then they bump me up in rank. I'm an E4. I'm, I'm getting around all this, of why I'm telling you this. There's a purpose. And next thing I know, I find myself, I'm being medical discharged from the military. I began getting tired, sleepy all the time, forgetful, and they sent me down to get a sleep test done. Being the commander's driver, i got to be awake. And they come to find out that I had severe obstructive sleep apnea. And now they're telling me, you're done. You can stay in the military and sit behind a desk, or you, you will not be infantry. And I knew in that moment I didn't want to sit behind a desk. And so they shipped me over to a warrior transition unit. And I find myself at this unit, and the, the partying and the drinking and everything still going on, which is extremely, it's not good for somebody who has severe obstructive sleep apnea, because I actually knew somebody in the warrior transition unit that was doing the very same thing, had the same condition I had, and he died. And I remember the last night while I was in the Army, I was with a friend of mine, a guy that I used to go out drinking with. And we were sober that night. And I, I remember something that I haven't experienced in a long time. As I was sitting there with him, the Lord nudged me. Prompted me. Jeff, tell him about me. And I was... In that moment, I was just so broken over it. And I looked at my friend Patrick with this disturbed face, and I said, Patrick, i got to tell you something. I said, man, I've been living a lie for a long time. I said, the guy that you know is not who I'm supposed to be. And I began telling Patrick about how Jesus died for his sins and was buried and raised from the dead. Now, he didn't give his life to Christ. And after I got out of the military, years later, he sent me a text message. He said, Jeff, I want to let you know I love you. He said, after I got out of the military, I got put into alcohol rehab. And while I was there, they gave me a Bible called a Serenity Bible. And it's a Bible that points out verses for rehabilitation. And he said, Jeff, the words that you said to me that night came to life when I began to read that Bible. 
And he said that I believe in Jesus too. And after I got out of the army, I found myself 27 years old living back with my parents. And I was broken. Here, I have gone down every avenue in life trying to appease my, fe- my flesh, to satisfy my flesh. And I remember my mom would leave her Bible out, and I would, they would go to work, my mom and dad would, and I would come downstairs, and I'd have a cup of coffee, and I'd just begin reading God's Word. And when I would read it, I was so convicted. And I just remember God speaking to me, Jeff, I haven't, I haven't called you to a life of failure. I have purpose for you. I have meaning for you. I've called you to a life of victory, not of failure. And it was through that, those moments with the Lord, reading his word, that I realized that I had gotten tangled up with legalism, trying to make myself right with God just by obeying his law, or trying to please the Lord by obeying his law. And you know what the word of God said? Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are saved by God's grace through faith. It's by God's grace. That means I can't earn salvation. I can't make myself right with God. And then I read the words in Galatians. For you have been set free, dear brothers and sisters. Only don't use your freedom to satisfy the flesh. But use your freedom to serve one another in love. I had it all wrong. I was looking inside all the time and seeing all the terrible things of this person that I had become. But the real focus that I needed was it needed to be an external focus. It needed to be external. That God had called me to be the hands and feet of Christ and that if I would focus in on loving people and serving the Lord with my hands and my feet and my mouth, and, and know that I am saved by God's grace. I can't earn it. I didn't do anything for it. And it's only by the blood of Jesus that we are saved. And I'm free. In him, I am truly free. And so I began doing these baby steps. Began reading God's word daily. And then I began attending church again. And got involved in a Sunday school class and we began having Bible studies. I enjoyed the fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I began, I was working with my dad doing painting to, for a living. And I began taking, I wanted to be faithful to the Lord and the small stuff. I remember the scripture when it says, To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, what little they have will be taken away. And so I began taking the little things, being faithful in the little things, taking my offering, saying, Lord, I want to give this to you. And then I began praying. I said, God, God, where, where do you want me to serve in your church? And I'll never forget, the youth minister, and his name was Jason, but it's not Jason Hodge, it's Jason McRae, that was at at Valley Creek at the time. He calls me up, he says, hey man, I heard you just got out of the army, and you got a lot of time on your hands. I'm doing a youth walk-in, and I need chaperones. They were at the very place that it all started. The youth walk in. And the Lord brings it all back around. <laughs> and so I started serving with the youth. I went on this youth walk in. And my, my relationship began to grow so rich in the Lord. Just off these, these basic, basic Christian steps, basic Christian disciplines. 
And just knowing that I'm free in Christ, that I, I stop looking on the inside and say, God, you know what? I, I, I can't do anything to earn your grace. All I can do, I can serve you and use my hands and feet and serve you and try to truly love others. And the, and the scripture says the whole law is summed up when you do this one thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> and I remember through the youth group that I'm now serving with, Jason asked me to give my testimony. And then from there, the doors began to open again. That same call was still in my life. God was calling me to preach. I remember there was a, a pastor that was that did a second job, and he was putting siding on the side of my parents' house, and I got to talking with him. Next thing I know, he's asking me, hey, why don't you come to my church and give your testimony? And door after door began to open to preach. Now, I want to tell you all that stuff that happened to me in the military. I want, to, I want you to see how God has turned this around, how he is using this. God used my time in the army. I was medical discharged for sleep apnea. It has provided for the path that God has, had me, has me on now of doing an itinerant, uh, as an itinerant evangelist, traveling the world, preaching the gospel, seeing people saved. When I got out of the Army, my dad, used, my dad used to work for Northwest Airlines, and I lost his benefits because Northwest didn't give their benefits to, after the age 23, to, to his children. And then they merged with Delta, and then all of a sudden I get my dad's benefits back. Now I can fly almost anywhere in the world for 40 bucks. And because I went in the military, they gave me, and because I was medical discharged, they gave me voc rehab, and it gave me the ability to go back to school. And the Lord called me back to school. And not only that, the, the, after I, Boke Rehab ran up, I had the GI Bill, and I went to get my master's. And then my second master's, and then I started working on possibly doing a PhD. I started doing leveling work. But I want to tell you, when the Lord made me realize that he was calling me to be an evangelist, and before I went back to school, after I got out of the Army, and was walking strong with the Lord again, the Lord had been calling me on this mission trip to go down to Texas. And I knew he had put it on my heart. And I kept putting it off thinking, well, school's coming up and God wants me to go back to school too. And, and I thought, he definitely doesn't want me to go back to Western Kentucky University. He wants me to go to a Bible school. And so I started looking at Toccoa Falls, Georgia. I started looking at Boyce College up there in Louisville. And the time for school was coming up, and I kept saying, Lord, what school do you want me to go to? Finally, I just took off, and I went down to the co, and I got down there, and nothing worked out. I mean, doors shut in my face. BA paperwork didn't process, couldn't get a, uh, any income coming in down there. I mean, it was just a, a, big, it was a big fiasco. Got a place. And so I ended up coming home. At the school, school didn't open up to me because the BA paperwork didn't process, and so I went back home, and here I was sitting, sitting back at my parents' house, and then that mission trip came to mind again. And I'll never forget, my, my mom came up to me and said, Jeff, you got all this time on your hands. She's like, well, maybe I'll think about going down to Texas and serving down there. I knew then, I said, Lord, you've been telling me that for a long time. And then all of a sudden, you're speaking through my mom. And, and I remember sharing this with my friend Adam. I said, Adam, I'm, I'm going to go down to Texas and serve at a place called Mission Arlington down there. He's like, man, that's, that's cool. He's like, what are you going to be doing? I said, well, I'm going to be just serving homeless and and helping out any way I can. And there's some reason the Lord wants me to go on this trip. He goes, man, that's great. I tell you what, I got your way. I got all these free flower miles saved up. And God took care of the cost to go down there. Even though I, had my, you know, my, I got my dad's benefits back. But he's like, man, I got it, no, no problem. It would have been 80 bucks in my pocket, 80 bucks I would have had to put toward it. But Adam, Adam's like, man, I got you, dude. So I go down there. And I, I couldn't figure out, I'm like, Lord, why do you have me here? And I said, Lord, I could have been serving poor people in Kentucky. And I started praying. I said, God, show me why you have me here. And about midway through the week, this lady named Miss Tilly, who's the head of Mission Arlington, she came up to me and she said, Jeff, she's like, I want you to do something for me. She's like, I have this little, I had this gymnasium, we had this small classroom, and 
every week we go and we pick up all these kids from the community in this bus. She's like, I just want to know if you would, gra- you would take that bus, go pick up all these kids with some of the chaperones, and bring them back to this gymnasium, and if you could give a message. And she said, we have about 80 kids, and you're not going to be able to get them in this, this small room, but you can bring them in there about 20 at a time. So I started praying. I said, you know, okay, Lord, obviously this is why you have me here. And I, says, I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach? What do you want me to say to these kids? And it's like I heard it in a whisper. Give my testimony. And when I heard that, I knew it wasn't my testimony that God wanted me to give. It was the gospel. And we'd bring these kids in there 20 at a time. And I'd share the message of the gospel with them. And all around the room, kids saying, I want to give my life to Christ. And I knew right then and there, Jesus, you're calling me to be an evangelist. I look back on my life and I saw this pattern of how God was using me, taking me from place to place, preaching the gospel. I've seen how God has provided for me to do this work. And so when I, when I got back home, I knew then, and then God called me back to school, and guess what he said? He said, ah, Jeff, I want you to go back to Western Kentucky. I don't want you to go to a Bible school. I want you to go to Western Kentucky. And when I went down there, and the school was just about to start, and I, I, I was kind of wondering if I was going to get in in time, but I did. And I was rushing down there, and I, I wanted a Christian roommate. I wanted somebody that I could do life with. And I remember I didn't know where to live, and I began praying. I said, Lord, where do you want me to live? And, and I remember it came to mind with this, that my friend Brad used to live this, this place called Western Place down there, the apartment complex. And I went over there, and I went in, and I sat down in the chair in front of this guy who was gonna, I was going to talk with about getting a room. And he was an ex-Marine. I was ex-Army, and we hit it off. And then he, he, uh, he looked at me and said, man, my brother just moved out, and I need a roommate. He's like, dude, you're a good dude. He's like, I'd like to, like to live with you. And I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, do you party, drink, smoke, or anything like that? He goes, no. He said, I'm a youth minister. <laughs> <laughs> and next thing I know, I got, I got a Christian roommate, and I go back to school, and instead of this time, when I first went to school, it's for exercise science and nutrition And I knew that I I lost interest in that. Now I had a hunger for winning souls. And I wanted to win people to Jesus. And so when God called me back to school, I knew that I wanted my everything to focus in on this one thing, this one thing to win souls for Christ. And so when I went to Western Kentucky University, I changed my major and my minor over to uh, religious studies and communication. I wanted to learn about the religions of the world so I could witness the people of the religions of the world. I took an emphasis in Christianity, and it just so happens there was a scholar there named by Dr. Trafton, who is a, a believer in Christ, and he gave in, incredible Bible classes. And I learned so much about the Bible through his classes. And so I even got the education that I was hoping for. And being at a secular school, I'm able to reach people for Christ. And I remember this. I remember walking through campus one day, and I look over, and I see this old football stadium st- and sitting in the middle of campus. And I'd been praying for a while. I said, Lord, show me how to reach this campus for you. And I look over and I see this stadium. And I just imagined it being filled with people and the gospel being preached. And I said, Lord, if that's from you, show me how to make it happen. And I just started attending this church called Hillview Heights. And I went on a snowboard trip with, their, um, with the adult group there. And there was this guy who attended. And his name was Derek. And I, got, I befriended Derek on this trip, and we got to talking, and I shared with him this vision about the gospel, this, this stadium being filled and this gospel being preached. He goes, man, that is awesome. He's like, I tell you what. He's like, he's like I'm a chaplain in a fraternity. And he said, we have chapter meetings. And he said, I can get you into every one of them. And you go in there and you invite them to this thing. I said, are you kidding me? And God opened the door, and I went and I stood before everyone in a fraternity and in a sorority. You're talking about hundreds of people at different meetings. 
And I go in with this, and I, I kept praying. I said, God, what do you want me to say? How do you want me to invite these people to this, re, this, this, this revival on campus? And the Lord put this on my heart. And I walk in there, and I stand before them. And I said, look, I said, we are young, and all we think about is having a good time. And I said, but what will happen to you when you die? And I said, do you have peace about that? Do you have peace about where you will go when you die? And I said, listen to me, I said, later this, this week, I'm going to do a, this, I'm going to have an event on campus. And I want you to come here because I want to tell you about how you can have peace about where you can go when you die. I want to tell you about what Jesus Christ has done for you and how you can have peace with God. And later that week, I get a call from the, the BCM. My brother was working there at the time, Baptist Campus Ministries. And the president of the BCM heard about what I was doing. He said, Jeff, he's like, I want to give you a band, and I want to give you all the electronics and everything to do this event. And the next thing I know on this date, a revival broke out. We had over 100-something people show up, and the gospel was being preached. And back then, I, you know, I, I didn't know, but I was a young evangelist back then. Trying to give an invitation to something I've never done like that was crazy. And believe me, I had people mock me. I had people make fun of me, but I didn't care. I knew lives were being changed. After I graduated from there, I moved on. Went down to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary to get my education. God got me hooked up into the homeless shelters preaching the gospel. God opened up doors for me to preach in prisons. And the next thing I know, God has opened doors for me to go on a mission trip. First mission trip I went to was Malaysia, in the jungles of Malaysia, to share the gospel. And then God just began to open up one door after the next. Within three years, I was in eight different countries preaching the gospel. And to this day, I've been to 15 different countries. And here in just a minute, I'm going I'm to end with a story that the Lord did. I remember when I was in Nepal, we had been preaching all week, going out to homes and, and visiting with people. We were working with about six different churches that were there in Nepal and Bootwall. And the, next, the last day there, we, there was this one church that we were working with that had this, this youth group that loved to dance and sing and perform. And the last day there, they go out on the street corner and they start dancing. They just break out, dancing and singing for Jesus. And next thing you know, we have about a thousand something people that surround this thing and are watching it. And Gary Gawkin, the coordinator, looks over at me of the trip and he said, Jeff, as soon as they finish, get out there and preach the gospel. And we had one problem, though that there was no street lamps, it was going to be pitch dark. And the moment the sun went down, we would have no light. And so we all huddled up and we all began praying, saying, God, provide light. Provide light that they may hear the good news. And right as they finished, the sun had went down and it was dark, and then right as they finished, somebody pulls up on a, a motorcycle and flips on their light. People started pulling out cell phone lights and flashlights. And next thing I know, me and my interpreter go out there and we preach the gospel boldly. And we're talking, talking I'm preaching to Hindus. And at the end of that message, we saw over 40 something people come forward to give their lives to Christ. I tell you all of this is that God can take your broken life, He can take the terrible things that you have done, and He can turn it around and use it for His glory. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you. And I tell you right now, if you give your life to Christ, God will make something great of you.
and it's free. His grace is free. And it's given to you upon belief and surrender, saying, God, I'm yours. And listen to me, you, you, can't, you can't obey this Bible the way that God wants you to. You need him. You need him to come in and give you the power and the ability to live the Christian life. You can't do it. But there's one who can. And his name is Jesus. And if you open your heart, he'll come in and he'll begin to live his life through you. And he'll take you places and he'll do things with your life that you never thought you'd possibly do. And I tell you right now, it is a life of peace and joy when your trust is in the Lord. And it's on that cross, Jesus died for your sins. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means every single person, we are all sinners. We've all broken God's law. 1 John 3, 4 says, everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. For all sin is lawlessness. We're lawbreakers. And as lawbreakers do, we, there's punishment for that. But the Bible tells us when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. And Jesus came and he lived a holy life. He lived a life that you and I can't live. He lived a sinless life. And Jesus came to offer himself for you that you may have life. He willfully laid down his life to be put on that cross, to be beaten, to suffer, to be mocked, to be persecuted. And wicked mankind put him up on that cross, and he willfully let them do it. He had the power to stop them. God in the flesh. He had the power to stop them, but he let wicked mankind put him on that cross because he saw one thing in mind. He saw what would come from it. And that's a relationship with you. And it's only through the cross that you can have a right standing relationship with God. But it didn't end there. Jesus was buried. And three days later, he was raised from the dead. And he's alive. He's alive. He, he's, he's alive as just as you and I are today. He's alive. <laughs> and standing before you is one of the greatest decisions you'll ever have to make in your life. And you can't make it based on what your friend decides. You can't base it on what your wife or your spouse or your husband decides. You can't make it based on what your boyfriend or girlfriend decides. But the decision is this, the same decision that I made many years ago, sitting up against that tree when I had that bag of letters. I believed in Jesus. But it was that moment of surrender where I said, God, I'm yours. And will you today make that same decision and let God transform your life and use you for his glory, for his kingdom, for his name. I'm going to ask Corey to come and play. Is Corey in here?
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? Do you have peace about that? Do you have peace about where you will go when you die? You can. You can have it right now. And if that's you, if you've never made that decision in your life, and all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if that's a decision you want to make, I want to ask you to raise your hand, slip it up high. Anyone in this room, Maybe in your life, you were like me, running down paths that lead to dead ends. And maybe if you were to die today, maybe you would stand before the Lord and you would say, God, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of the way I've been living. And you say, Jeff, that's me. Will you pray for me? I won't call you out, but I want to ask you to raise your hand, and I want to pray for you. Will you slip your hand up? Amen. Anyone else? Amen. You say, God, I'd be ashamed. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for those that were being honest with you. And Father, I do pray for them. I know that path. A path of no peace. And I know what it is to wrestle with sin. But Father, I pray that today, God, their trust would be just completely in your grace and what you have done on the cross. And that in you, we we are free. We are forgiven For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. As your servant Paul said, so now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray this day, Lord, I pray that they set their minds on being a servant for you. That they would focus on loving people, trusting in your grace, knowing that we are sinners and we mess up. But I do pray that they strive for righteousness. They strive for holiness, to be like the Lord. But Lord, as you said, the whole law is summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I pray that those that raise their hand, God, I pray that you give them healing. And I pray that you take them down a path of righteousness. And God, you use them greatly for your kingdom, Lord, to bring your name glory, to lift your cross high for all to see. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar is open. If you feel that God has been really tugging on your heart, then I just ask you to come and pray. As we listen to the worship music, and however God's stirring your heart. As I said this morning, this side over here, I I make this kind of the side of surrender, and this side over here is a side of need. If you want to come, so you got a need that you need to be prayed for, you come. I'm going to ask the pastor to come. And I'm going to stand over here. So whatever you want to do, whatever God's putting on your heart, you come. This is a week of renewal. You come.